Uh, it's been a really exciting time for us at Progress Partners as we've expanded beyond our traditional um, uh, roots within MarTech and AdTech and really expanded into new fields, one which is near and dear to my heart, this one that we have a panel on today, which is FinTech. Um, and for that, we have a great panel lined up for you today. And they're going to give us a varying perspective on the market. Since we figured that it would be helpful to just start at the ground and sort of work our way up, we're going to talk about the consumer and drill a little deeper into how FinTech is actually affecting the consumers in the market today. So I'm going to go down and I'm just going to, I'm going to introduce everyone here uh, instead of having everyone intro introduce themselves. And we're just going to jump into some uh, questions. Once I start to you know, question these guys, I'm also going to ask you guys to, to think about how you see FinTech and how FinTech is affecting you and maybe some questions for them. And hopefully we can have some good banter uh, from the audience to our panel here today. So Sharman uh, with us today, she's the Managing Director at Wellsimple, an online portfolio platform that allows you to anyone to find the right investment at the right time. We then have Michael, the CEO of MarCorp. Uh, it's a family office that invests across a number of industries. We've taken a position in PaySend, a well-known uh, fintech payments provider uh, in the space. And then finally, we have Richard uh, from Movin, one of the original challenger banks um, uh, in the world, actually. Uh, the, you know, on par with the N26s of the world, uh, they're backed by SoftBank, and uh, they have a personalized banking solution for, for customers uh, across the globe. So thank you guys. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I am going to sit down, but, uh, but before I do, we're in the midst of a market, uh, really a technical transition period in the market right now. It's really impressive how companies are looking for new ways, these traditional FIs, big banks, to solve problems for their customers. But I want to focus on your companies and your customers and how you think about it from marketing to product development and even regulation and how it affects the customer. And Michael, I want to start with you. As an investor in the market, um, you know, how do you think about investing in companies? What are the, what, when you look across the vast fintech landscape, what are the customer metrics or metrics that you know, you're looking at that help you decide on a good investment in this market? I, I think most investment bankers will tell you, uh, you, you have to get your metrics right uh, so you can sell your company for a billion dollars because that's, yep. that, that's what we hire you for, David. <laughs> um, but the, the metrics you're looking at is what's your cost of acquiring a client? You know, the cost of acquisition is critically important. Uh, we try to, and we've been extremely successful at, uh, at PaySend at uh, acquiring clients for less than uh, $10 a client. Yeah. Okay, and then you're looking at what the lifetime value is. A lot of that is because you have a lot of organic growth. Uh, but that, that's one of the critical metrics that everybody's going to see because if you're raising money, they're going to say, okay, where are you going to spend the money? How do I know I'm going to get the return on this? And what's the lifetime value of your customers? What I look at is I look at the growth of new customer acquisition on a daily basis. We get daily reports at 9 o'clock at night. Boom, you go through. This is your 40-page report. I know the metrics I'm looking at. And you're looking at how many clients did you acquire. Uh, also critically important is what is the engagement of those clients. So not only do you want the growth rate to continue to increase, and we've been lucky in the first two years of operation, we've exceeded a million clients. Uh, which is, you know, if you look at some of the high fintech in the UK, that's higher than, than most. But you, you're looking at the engagement rate. And, and what we're finding now is after the, the second year, the engagement rate is going way up. So even if we didn't grow, the lifetime value of those customers is growing a lot more than we actually anticipated. So there are a couple of metrics you're looking at, lifetime value, but how you're driving lifetime value is the engagement and the growth rate of your clients and the cost of acquisition. And so and as an investor, there's some of the key metrics. Mm -hmm. Obviously, management team is everything. You wouldn't invest in a, a great idea if you didn't have a great management team also. I think that's a good point in terms of customer acquisition as a metric. Um, th there's a lot of um, discussion in the space. Uh, recent fundraisers in the neo banking space uh, around customer acquisition numbers, and you really have to dig down uh, and understand exactly what customer acquisition means, uh, whether or not whether or not that means customer downloads or how well do they actually convert 
retain and monetize those customers. So there's, there's uh, in my mind, there's little focus on that at this point, but I think as we progress um, um, in the space, you'll start to, um, people will start to drill down on that and have some more data to, um, to reveal. Yeah, you mentioned just then for a second, let's even take a step back about challenger banks. What a challenger bank is. Um, a, a lot of people in the crowd might not know uh, this concept, right, of, uh, uh, of, of, a, of a new bank coming into the market that doesn't have the traditional brick and mortar that we are used to seeing the Bank of America of the world. How do you, uh, Richard, uh, d uh, define challenger bank? So, so, you know, I guess the, the, um, uh, the most popular definition of a challenger bank is challenging the incumbent brick and mortar large institutional banks. Um, that's not how we see it. We don't see that as necessarily the fight we want to fight. Um, what we're doing is accepting a challenge in the market to serve the underserved, to serve the unbanked, to serve the underbanked, um, who still rely on some form of alternative financial service to get through the day. So that, that's how we've perceived it. To, to, to think that um, a, a, a small fintech company with limited resources and, and really it's just its technology to go up against the JP Morgan Chase, which I think last year made $32 billion. Um, that's really not a fight we can fight. Um, but what we can do is, is we can, you, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, what we can do is, is demonstrate that it, it, there is a way to serve that cohort of US consumers and serve them well. Uh, Charmin, uh, in terms of reaching customers and um, how you market to them, ultimately, it, it, it's a different approach that you have to take that a lot of people don't realize in fintech or in financial services as a whole. Um, you, you just got to be more cognizant of things. You cannot, there's, there's more rules and regulations, right, in playing with it. And you've yeah. experienced it from both prior, you, where you were not constrained by it, to now today at Well Simple, where you maybe have to think about that a little bit more. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, if I'm being honest, like financial service is one of the most boring things to sell to people because unlike the people in this room that are passionate about it and know a lot about it, most people couldn't care less. And even though it affects us every single day and it's such an important part of our lives, um, most people are financially illiterate. So actually 70% of millennials in America are financially illiterate. So they don't know the most basic things about like, they don't know what interest rate means. You know, that's a huge problem. So not only are they not engaged and not interested, interested they're also uneducated. And so that's, we, uh, education is a huge part of our marketing strategy. And uh, we wanna close that gap and make sure they're making smart choices and they're not being taken advantage of or paying unnecessarily high fees or they're in investment vehicles that don't make sense for their goals. So. I would say start with understanding your customers and then educating them. And we actually talked about that you are, um, you're a Canadian company, yes. right? Fastest growing um, uh, investment company in Canada. Too. Fastest growing investment company in Canada. Why Canada? Why not the US? Good question. Well, the founders are Canadian. Oh, okay. So that's easy. Um, but also, uh, there are a lot of really interesting fintech companies in the US, not so much in Canada. Uh, so there's less competition, it's a smaller market, it's easier to win. Mm -hmm. And uh, what else? Oh, another big one is that Canadians pay some of the highest fees in the world. Uh, almost 2% on average, which is insane and totally wow. unnecessary. So we wow. offer, we were the first to offer, excuse me, a low fee investment vehicle yeah. uh, or, or service, I should say. Um, and our fees are 0.5%, which is a game changer. So not only are all of the new investors, millennials, people that are just getting into it, they're coming to us in droves, but also high net worth individuals. They can save so much money by transferring to us. We're offering a better service at a much lower fee, and we're still, we still have that human touch. So it's, um, it's really exploding in, in Canada. It's amazing, actually, and we, we almost didn't realize this until we got together, but um, Michael also paysend right, is they don't operate in the U.S. either, correct? No, they're uh, launching in the U.S. in November. Uh, however, we're a U.K. financial institution. A lot of the uh, fintech companies have started in the U.K., um, and, but we're in 70 countries already. Uh, so the U.S. being the biggest market for uh, global transfers uh, is where we're coming next, and that's when, you know, we've grown extremely rapidly. We're 
real excited about hitting the U.S. market. Yeah. Why, market why is that? Why, yeah. why is it that we are talking three international companies? Why is it that fintech in Europe and in other places seems to be um, gaining more traction? Even though the big ones, a lot of the big ones we know about, yeah, the SoFi's of the world are here. It just feels like the innovative ones are really coming from outside the U.S. Yeah, that's, that's a simple question to answer and it really comes down to the regulatory environment. It's not that they're so fast, it's that we're so slow. Um, <laughs> Great. Uh, you know, if we go back to 2011, you know, uh, move in along with, um, with Simple, we're the first neobanks to arrive. And um, if we look at Europe, um, N26, Monzo, Revolut, they're all coming to the shores now, but those, those, those organizations are only founded back in 2015, 2016. But um, in, you know, but what supported their success is the availability of data in terms of um, GDPR, um, different data requirements, consumer data requirements, and more importantly, the FinTech charter that they offer, which enables them to deliver on a widespread basis. Um, here in the States, we're, 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 we're kind of constricted to the old paradigm of uh, delivering banking services and capabilities to our communities through CSA requirements and, and, and things like that. Um, we've engaged in discussions with the OCC. Um, they've recently um, made an effort to support the, uh, the FinTech Charter, but it was immediately um, um, you know, sidelined by the you know, New York Department of Financial Services. And you know, so there, there's a tremendous amount of friction. There, there are obstacles. Um, whether or not that, that they're all really uh, coming from the incumbent banks you know, who, are, who are causing this delay, but um, not for me to say. But uh, that, that is really, I would say, the most important obstacle that we face right now. A lot of us uh, are, have talked about the, um, the underbanked uh, population, not just of the world. I, I think of the world, it's far broader, but in the United States alone, there's a significant underbanked portion, which a lot of us probably don't know about. It, you know, in this room, my guess is most of us have a bank account, right, of some sort. Um, but we were just talking before we walked up on stage, that's not true necessarily of a large swath of people, right, that, we are, that you guys are all looking to serve. Tell us a little bit about how you're able to reach, go after, talk to those customers, engage them. Yeah, it's, um, it's a huge problem. And I think, uh, gosh, where do I even begin? <laughs> <laughs> I think people are highly skeptical of financial services and institutions because of the recent collapse, especially millennials. We were entering adulthood as this was happening. Um, and so it's like no surprise that like the number one personality trait that millennials uh, admire is trust, is um, honesty. Mm -hmm. And you look at the current financial institutions in America and they're wrapped up in scandals and yeah. they've really screwed us over so many yeah. times and they don't get penalized for it. Like there's, you know, so um, I don't want to get political, but uh, yeah. it's, it's a huge problem. So then you have all of these people that are highly skeptical of the current offering. Um, they're also underserved because they're not high, ne high net worth individuals right. and traditional financial institutions only go after high net worth individuals. So you have this huge gap and that's one of the reasons why Wealthsimple was founded is to serve these individuals. It's really an opportunity right now for you guys, yeah, right? I, I mean, more than anything else? For, for the FinTech space, it's, it's a matter of delivery. Um, you know, the majority of what you would call the unbanked or the underbanked, those are a cohort of individuals that have to rely, uh, you know, in part or wholly on some form of an alternative financial service. The way I've kind of envisaged this in my mind is there's the heaven and hell. There's the heaven of the traditional commercial banks that people aspire to have an account at, um, to, to be able to qualify for a loan. And then there's the hell of the alternative financial services that once you dip your toe in it, you could never get out of it. It's, it's an ecosystem that's self-fulfilling. Um, what we're looking to do is occupy that middle ground um, and, and through, you know, through the efficiency of a digital delivery system. And what we're, what we're, able, to, what we're able to offer um, in, through our product and our platform is, is really a sense of financial, not just financial mobility, but financial stability. You know, a lot of the underbank, they, they operate in the gig economy. So the, the, the biggest challenge there is when is my next paycheck and how much is it? 
uh, I don't know. So that's what, Ronnie, kind of give birth to like a, a pay active um, or some type of, of feature where you can kind of, um, uh, you know, upfront your, your, your next paycheck. Um, but sometimes that's just not enough. They have to have um, credit solutions. But it, it, can't be the credits, it can't be the credit solution that the bank wants to sell you. It has to be the credit solution that's right for you to get you to your next paycheck. Um, it's got to be responsible lending. And how do you do that? You do that through better data, and you do that through better delivery. Can I look at also the, the way that uh, the, the underbanked are uh, being ripped off by the financial institutions? I mean, just to transfer money. I, I use an example of Western Union, right? Somebody goes to Western Union, you get charged a $10 fee, and then the FX rate is like 4%. Yep. And so you, you, you add it up, and these are the migrant community workers, and, and we serve a lot of those in our global transfer business. Absolutely. We'll, in the U.S., charge $2 and, and give them a very tight, less than 1% FX spread. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the, if the thought is, we'll do that, and then we'll be immediately transferred. Mm -hmm. So the speed and, and the ability to get the money to the recipient in a foreign country, in a remote location, where sometimes it, it actually takes days to get it, if you, you look at it. And, and so we're obliterating the model where, yeah. where each, if, if somebody transfers two times a month their paycheck back home, they will save enough money in fees to do one extra one a year. And mm. for these communities, that is a lifesaver. Oh, I totally agree, but it almost sounds like that's a third world problem, but that's actually a first world problem <laughs> with ACH. It yeah. still takes days. They don't operate on the weekends. No, right. I mean, you know, the we Fed. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. But, you know, the Fed has come around with uh, FedNet, I think, but that's not due to come out for another few years. Um, that's going to accommodate, provide a public solution to money transfer, interstate money transfer within the United States. Um, but again, it's, it, it really kind of points to the slow moving uh, regulatory environment that is not accommodating um, those it's supposed to serve. It is amazing. I mean, in, um, in 2000 and 2001, I was, um, I was helping getting them from, it was T plus seven, which was transaction day plus seven. So imagine, you know, you initiated the wire transfer or the, the ACA transfer and it took seven days to settle. Now it's at, a, you know, it's almost at T plus one, almost to T plus zero now, if you really push it, right? But like, that's not universally settled yet, right, on that. And actually, it gets to my next question, and Michael, maybe you can uh, uh, take this one to start, which is, what are the, what are the obstacles to those adopting those technologies that help bridge a lot of these gaps that we're talking about. So, so you talk about blockchain, or you talk about you know bitcoins. Are there things out there that you're either looking at and saying, yeah, that's going to help, or, yeah, that's not going to do anything. That's not going to solve the problems I need. Well, I, I think if you look at blockchain, and, and we do, we have a uh, stable coin at Paysend, and uh, we're going to use the blockchain technology, the Stellar Network. Uh, the thought process is a lot of the uh, financial institutions' internal systems, the way the central banks transfer money between central banks through the CLS system, uh, the SWIFT network, all of these are very antiquated systems. Blockchain actually alleviates those problems from a speed standpoint, a messaging standpoint. You don't send the dual messaging. We actually have the solution architected for that. That's, more of what will come out next year at Paysend and some of our future products, but we're aligned with the right players. Uh, but the adoption rate is going to be slow. You've got big financial institutions. They have their internal networks to turn these things around, and I've spent 30 years with these major institutions, so I know it takes forever to get anything done in these institutions. You have the people. You have their, their archaic systems. Uh, so it takes a revolution, and I think that's what we're really in in the fintech space, and I think we're lucky to be here, and there's a reason why you get all these crazy valuations associated with fintech, because it will eventually eliminate a lot of the services and the high costs uh, yeah. for the consumer. Yeah, and I think what we're really waiting to see um, with all of the, you know, you know I'm with Move-In, uh, a, a, a challenger bank. We have some competition coming to the shores. How do I see that? Is that a threat to me? Uh, absolutely not. Actually, I want them to succeed because they're validating the market for us. And what we're trying to do is loosen the grip um, of, of the incumbents 
with regard to holding on to all the primary bank accounts. So once those statistics start to change in our favor, um, it creates a bigger pie for all of us to share. Now, what happens with fintechs over the next you know, five to 10 years? Do they start to get bought out by the larger banks because they finally capitulate? Most likely, in, in most cases. Um, but maybe some of them will stand on their own for, for quite some time. I don't know. Charmaine, yeah. Uh, one of the obstacles that we've encountered with helping people uh, on board to, to new technology is especially the older generation. There's a sense of trust when you interact with a human and you walk into a physical space, obviously. It's a lot of brands are facing this issue right now as they remove a brick and mortar uh, presence from their business model. Um, so now since everything is digital, there's like a fear, there's a lack of trust, like how can I, how do I know this is legit? Yeah. And um, that's something that a lot of, you know, we're all facing it. There's no, I wish there was a silver bullet answer, yeah. but. I, I, I agree with that, but I think this is also a generational thing and, and things are moving at an exponential rate. You know, I have, my dad now works, you know, plays with his iPhone, he knows how to use it better <laughs> than me and I'm like, wow, okay. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, there's, there's something to be said about that. that. You know, a lot of people would talk about uh, the automated car that, oh, you know, no one's going to, you know, relinquish their control over or, or the, the ability to drive their own car. I said, well, you know, a 17-year-old kid who's just getting his learner's permit doesn't really care about driving a car. He'd rather have more time to be on his phone, yeah, yeah. maybe doing banking. I don't know. <laughs> but um, they, they don't have that allegiance to uh, certain you know, luxuries or, or I guess uh, you know, necessities that, that, that in the way we view it. Um, so it is a, definitely a generational thing. But I think everyone, um, cool. especially in the States, is more accustomed to technologies. Yeah. Um, they, they're, they're quicker to adopt them. So yeah. I don't, I think over the next even three to five years, that those are the terms I use as opposed to 10 to 15 now, three to five years with this exponential growth and, and adoption of technology, you'll start to see these real paradigm shifts in, uh, in banking and, 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 and every, diff every type of disrupted industry um, these days. I, I actually, I remember I just, uh, I, I, a few days ago, I was taking a picture of a check to deposit it into my account, and I went to my son who's 10. I'm like, look at how cool this is. I can take a picture and deposit it. And he's like, what's that check for? Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, someone paid me. And that's a check. That it's worth something. And Might he's like, well that, that doesn't make sense. You know, like, <laughs> hey. And it's like, yeah, that's probably going to go away. They should go away. There's no reason to have a check anymore. Like, I, I don't get it. Um, we have a couple minutes. Uh, are there any questions out in the crowd? Be happy to answer. Um, our, like I said, you have a great panelist here today. Otherwise, we can sort of keep asking questions uh, directly. Anyone? Did you have a question? Nope. Okay. Anyone? All right. Well, then let me just jump to a couple questions. Uh, actually, Charmin, you had mentioned that you had a question sort of for the group as well earlier. Um, oh, I think you answered it already, though. We were talking about the oh, underserved well. and the ignored yeah. market. Yeah. yeah. Let me see if I can quick think of Well, no, it, it really it does get back to um, the consumer here is an underserved banking uh, customer for the most part. And I think what's hard for a lot of us to wrap our heads around is that that just exists as a market. Like, and how big is that market? Do you, guys, do you have any sort of high level stats on yeah. your on yeah. hand? I, I think only 28% of, of the US is considered, um, you know, Bank. Uh, not financially vulnerable, right. uh, you know? Um, so it, it leaves a, a huge space for people who not only are uh, more apt or, or, or in need of uh, financial literacy, uh, but the ability for l legacy banking capabilities and, and some intelligence behind that. And I think, you know, what, what you talked about before in terms of literacy, that's, that's, that is very helpful for, 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 you know, the consumer to meet the bank. But I think where the bank meets the consumer is utilizing, you know, um, machine learning and AI to, yeah. you know, to, to take away that cognitive lift. Um, some people don't know how to balance a checkbook. They probably never will. Um, but with the technology that we have, we can do that for you. You don't have to worry about that. You know, you look at your finances a little bit differently. Um, and I think the most important thing that we focus on um, is number one, do no harm. And, and number two is to personalize the experience for every user based on their data and what they need, how they spend their money, how they save it, what they're looking to buy, what their financial goals are. Um, and the type of credit that they would need to support those goals. So that's, that's basically how we've looked at this from a holistic sense. So 
One question right over there. What is the biggest challenge to getting consumers to actually use your, your platform? And is there a segment that you find to be most most apt to, to, uh, to sign on? I, I, I can start. I mean, the most likely to sign on are millennials. They're used to technology. Uh, they're very comfortable with uh, sending people money, giving them their credit card, their account number. Uh, this happens more in Europe. People are a lot more comfortable giving account numbers. But uh, even to get over that, what we're trying to do to address that is for some people like myself don't want to give my account number out to someone, to, even if it's to transfer money to me. Uh, our technology allows you to actually transfer it to their phone, their credit card, their debit card. So we've d developed different medium to get people over the hurdle. But I think what you're finding is it, it's like your dad, right? Your dad now has finally adopted it. Uh, and it'll take time. The millennials will push it, and that's where our biggest growth market is by far. And uh, that adoption, plus the migrant community, needs it so much because they save so much money. Uh, you're finding that they're early adopters now too, because it's uh, saving them money that they desperately need to. Charmin, did you have one last thing to say? Uh, yeah, I would just echo that. Our biggest uh, audience segment is millennials, and. But one thing that actually extends all audience segments that I found really interesting is that no matter how much money you have or what your background is, for some reason everyone has this like deep fear that they're not doing it right or that there's like some smarter thing out there that they should be doing, whether it's a bank or it's a transfer service or it's an investment product. Um, Everyone thinks that like they're the dumbest one in the room and there's some better thing out there that they should know about but they don't, but no one wants to talk about it because uh, we're taught that we shouldn't talk about money, it's impolite, and so we're all in the dark, we don't talk about it, we all have this fear, and uh, I think we just need to be more comfortable talking about money and learning about money and, and we'd all be better off. Yeah, the only one that likes to talk about money is the guy at the table that has all the money. Right. <laughs> and that's yeah. what you're today. Right? Yeah. Um, with that, thank you uh, very much for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. Progress really appreciates Thanks it. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everyone.